to Meanwhile in the West, my weekly program where I read through the letters to the editor in my local paper, The West Australian, and criticise the imbeciles for writing stupid things. Let's look at the first letter. Marley's Benign Ghost, 23rd of April, 2014. Marley Williams, a privileged AFL player, is found guilty of breaking a person's jaw and gets a 12-month suspended sentence. Where is the justice? Why have a jury and take no notice of their verdict? And if Mr. Nobody had committed the same offence, would the same result have been handed out? It's time that people responsible for sentencing are held accountable, possibly through regular performance reviews just like the rest of us. M. Nardi, Bibra Lake. So, if you're unaware, as pointed out here, a athlete uh, broke somebody's jaw and got 12 months suspended sentence. Um, or is the justice? Well, that's pretty much the justice. Um, as you say, where's the? why have a jury? Well, the jury decides on the facts of the matter. The judge decides on the sentence. That's the way that our legal system works and has worked for well, centuries now, if you stretch back to the English tradition. So the jury in this case found that Mr. Williams had indeed broken that person's jaw, and then the judge imposed the legal sentence. Now, I'm kind of amazed that you'd be claiming that this was a light sentence, and the idea that other people would get harsher sentences when it wouldn't have even been last week that people would have been writing in about some nobody having punched somebody else and having gotten a 12 month suspended sentence and complaining that that was too lenient um, and that these people should get harsher sentences. Um, essentially, as far as I can tell, this is a perfectly reasonable judgment. Um, I don't think this guy has any particular criminal history, doesn't have any particular reasons why he should receive you know, a higher sentence than anybody else. Um, and first offence type for an unprovoked uh, fight, um, or even an unprovoked attack, um, 12 months of sentence sentence is about what you get. That's what our legal system considers to be a reasonable offence. Um, and considering everything um, I know about the guy, um, that is probably quite reasonable. His chances of reoffending very low, the benefit to the community of locking him up very low as well. Um, and the idea... <laughs> The, um, the people who are responsible for sentencing are called judges, by the way, and the idea that we should have regular performance reviews, there's actually a really good reason why we don't do that. So judges are insulated from the criticism of, um, not criticism exactly, but they're insulated from the sort of public opinion like that, precisely so they can be impartial in their judgments. We don't want judges who are beholden to the kind of mob mentality and sort of cheap popularism that the politicians are beholden to. And that's why we have an independent judiciary that is somewhat insulated from that. Um, so I'm actually quite happy with this result. Next letter. Routes in reverse, 23rd of April 2014. I agree with Colin Guelphie about the disastrous change to a two-way traffic layout in William and Beaufort streets instead of one way. To and fro, letters 21st to the 4th. I no longer drive into the city or Northbridge, even though I used to frequent various shops there. It's now easier to go to the major suburban shopping centres. Jeff Moore, Perth. Now, I'm not sure if you actually live in uh, Perth, the suburb, or whether you just live in Perth, the sort of broader metropolitan area. Um, if you live in Perth, the suburb, and you expect to be able to drive, then you're nuts. Um, if you live in the broader metropolitan area and you have in the past driven into the city of Northbridge to frequent shops, then I understand that it comes as a bit of a shock, but there's been a long-term planning over at least the last 30 years to make the inner sort of central business district um, as unfriendly to cars as possible. Um, we are trying to keep traffic out of the central city, and this is in keeping with basically every other metropolitan, uh, large metropolitan centre around the world. Um, is we don't want them to be car friendly. We can't possibly make them particularly car friendly anyway because everybody wants to drive in them. So the best thing we do is actually try and drive the cars out so that we can replace them with things like pedestrians and uh, public transit. So yeah, uh, I'm sorry that, you know, as our attempts to drive cars out of the centre city has disrupted your, your regular way of doing things, um, the fact that you now go to suburban shopping centres is exactly what was intended. Um, so as the city has gotten bigger and bigger, we've tried to push people into suburban areas so that they, one, drive to a nearer shopping um, centre rather than to something in the centre of the city. Um, that cuts down on road congestion, that cuts down on things like traffic accidents, that cuts down on carbon footprint, and it's basically a win-win for everybody. So I'm sorry it personally inconveniences you, but it's actually much better for the city. A Common Voice, 24th of April 2014. 
Here's a chance for television and radio broadcasters, newsreaders and commentators to bring back T instead of D in words such as city or city. They of course are the worst offenders and wrong pronunciations are prolific. John Horner, Hamilton. Okay, so yes, technically um, the word city should have a T in it and you'll notice that I pronounce that as a T. Um, that's the British pronunciation. Um, and yes, lots of Australians would pronounce it as city. Uh, in the same way that we pronounce the number uh, that comes after 19 as 20, um, where we drop the, the T altogether. Um, one of the outstanding successes of the egalitarian culture in Australia has been that over the last hundred years or so, we have basically eliminated the educated Australian accent from the wild. Um, these things basically don't exist. Uh, unlike other cultures or countries, especially places like England, where um, there is still a strong accent divide between classes, um, in Australia we have pretty much gotten rid of a huge amount of that. Now that might sound surprising, um, but compared to a lot of other countries, um, we've done a remarkably good job of ensuring that our politicians, our judges, our elite um, ac academics, our university lecturers, our news readers, all prominent people basically sound like you or I and the person down the pub. Um, there is some variation still, but broadly speaking, um, we all sound very similar. And it is only the worst of the snobs I, that I ever find complaining about that, Mr Horner. Um, it is just class snobbery to suggest that um, your particular favoured way of pronouncing things should be the only way, or that, yeah, for some reason the broadcasters, newsreaders, uh, these people should be held to, they should have some accent that is inaccessible to the common person. Um, let's not pretend that the English language is written in a phonetic way. It is not. Uh, the English language is rife with words which are pronounced completely against the way they are spelt. And so any argument that the word city should be pronounced with a T purely because it's spelt with one is absolutely a poor argument on the face of it. Um, so actually I like the fact that these mispronunciations are done by prominent people in the news media because that reflects the way that the person in the, speak, in the street speaks and the way that we all understand. Friends or foe, 24th of April 2014. Yesterday I heard a government representative say on radio that no matter the cost we would continue the search for missing flight MH370 because we owe it to our friends the Chinese. A short time later, on the same station, I heard a military person say that we are buying a large number of fighter jets from the US in case China attacks us. I'm confused. Jim Grundy, Mount Helena. You are confused, Jim, because you have, confu you have bought into the simplistic metaphor that countries are like people, and that friendships between countries, for example, are like friendships between people. And you've also bought into the simplistic dichotomy that people are either, that countries are either friends or foes. Um, this is not what happens in the real world. Um, so, as, a, as almost every country in the world um, at the moment um, would agree, the people, the Chinese people, are friends of the Australian people. The Australian people as a nation are, a, broadly speaking, embrace humanitarian ideals where all life is sacred and all peoples should join together uh, for common good. And this means that when an uh, aeroplane crashes into the Indian Ocean, you know, and we are one of the closest countries that we feel an obligation to search for the survivors or the, you know, not the survivors, the search for the dead, um, purely because they are people like us, even if they happen to be Chinese. And so yes, we are friends with the Chinese people. Obviously the geopolitical um, situation around China's growing dominance in Asia, its growing military might, and its possible dom um, challenge to the hegemony of the United States means that we also need to make sure that our interests are not trampled by emerging giant nations within Asia. Um, some part of that, uh, China has seemed to be quite shown to be quite willing to sort of contest territorial type stuff in the South China Sea, and it would seem reasonable for us to uh, have a military presence that would allow us to repel any such things like this, um, primarily to act as a deterrent rather than any sort of sense that we would want to use it against somebody like China. And there you have it, five minutes-ish of uh, some, you know, amateur rambling by me explains something which I guess, but I guess that's more in-depth analysis than you can expect from a newspaper like this.
My Dawn Chorus, 26th of April 2014. To the mother behind me at the Kings Park Dawn Service, who allowed her upper school age children to eat potato chips throughout the service, shame on you. To the five teenage boys in my line of sight wearing sports caps throughout the service, shame on you. And to the people who still choose to bring dogs to an Anzac service, I'm completely speechless. There's a time and a place for everything. Barbara Gogner, Ross Moyne. Yeah, I think maybe you're speechless because you have no good argument against what these people's behaviour. I mean, on one hand, I think, yeah, okay, upper school aged children probably shouldn't be eating during a uh, solemn remembrance service for our nation's war dead, um, and I'll accept that. Uh, shame on you sounds a bit harsh. Um, the five teenage boys who are wearing caps, oh, I'm sorry to say it, maybe you're of the wrong generation, certainly of this generation, the idea that wearing a cap is somehow disrespectful and that one should remove one's cap when going inside or, I don't know, addressing a lady or something like that, um, is not something that is familiar to this generation. This doesn't mean that this generation doesn't understand manners, it just means they have different manners, they have different cultural customs to what you would like to impose upon them. Um, they have different ways of showing their respect. And I would suspect that the five teenage boys who made it to the dawn service in a you know, rather chilly Perth morning um, probably were there to pay their respects. Um, I, as a teenage boy, never did such a thing. Um, and so I would suspect that these people have some kind of actual reverence for the people who died. And whether they wore caps or not, they're probably showing it the best that, uh, in a heartfelt manner, like most Australians do. And the idea of bringing dogs to, uh, to a dawn service, I know lots of people do that. Um, I bring my toddler to a dawn service. My toddler's uh, not always quiet. I consider it an important part of his upbringing. Um, I don't really see there being an issue as long as the dogs aren't disruptive. We all show our respects in different ways, and just because we do it differently from the new do, Barbara, um, doesn't mean we're any less sincere about it. Support the crackdown, 28th of April 2014. Reese Jones says that if drivers with handheld mobile phones were so dangerous, you would not expect the 2013 road toll to fall to 162. Road toll and mobile phone usage, letters 24th of the 4th. Recently, I was almost injured on a roundabout by a driver on a mobile who failed to give way and didn't notice my vehicle. Police should be praised for addressing this problem. Heather King, Calaroo. Okay, so a little bit of backstory. This newspaper has been running articles, um, even gave a full, full page, um, front page spread to the problem of drivers uh, using mobile phones for calls and texting while driving, and the absolute danger that is posed. Um, after about a week or so of this sort of um, uh, article after article, letters to the editor, front page treatment, uh, a guy called Reese Jones writes in and basically says, um, if you look at the amount of road deaths that we've had across Australia, WA in particular, over the last, say, 10, 15 years, uh, 15 years ago, nobody had mobile phones. 10 years ago, maybe people started to have them. And it's really been the last 10 years, there's been a steady increase to the point where nowadays almost everybody has them. Lots of people have smartphones, and seemingly there's lots of people who are texting and calling. In that same time period, if we look at road deaths, um, they have fallen steadily. Basically, year on year, the absolute number of road deaths has been sort of maybe a bit steady, sometimes up, sometimes down, but the rate of road deaths per population has been falling steadily every year. The rate of road deaths per journey have been steadily falling, and the rate of road deaths per kilometer traveled. So no matter which measure you want to measure it from, basically, we've been getting safer and safer across the entirety of Australia and in basically all jurisdictions. Um, this seemed to be a very strong argument against the idea that this mobile phone um, usage was somehow causing an epidemic of road accidents. Um, it may be that there is an issue there, it probably is, um, but the hysteria with which it was being pushed was, you know, seems to be slightly contradicted by the statistics. Um, and this letter here is very indicative of the response that got. Essentially, you've got lots of people writing and say, I saw somebody driving badly while using a mobile phone, and therefore you can't be right, which is the quality of argument that we get to see on this status page. One thing that might explain what's going on here, because I think it, stupid letters aside, I think it is interesting that um, although we've had this steady increase in people's distraction while driving, if you like, we've also had a steady decrease in actual fatalities. Um, and other questions. And I think this could be related to a psychological phenomenon called risk compensation. And the basic idea of this is there seems to be some evidence, although it, it's not great, 
in all areas, but there seems to be some evidence that people have essentially a certain appetite for risk. So each person has a certain appetite for risk and they will vary their behaviour in order to maintain their level of risk. Um, for example, um, I noticed this myself when I was a young man, I used to drive around in some very unsafe vehicles and I drove a lot safer then than I do now when I'm driving around in a relatively safe vehicle. Uh, my overall level of risk has, is mitigated by my change in behaviour. When I know I've got good brakes, I tend to drive more aggressively. When I know I've got terrible brakes, I tend to be a lot more cautious. Um, and so what I would suggest is that perhaps what this is, is these people who nowadays are texting and phoning on mobile phones while driving, 15, 20 years ago, those kinds of people probably would have been playing with their radios or smoking and drinking and eating while driving. Um, in fact, when I was in the mid 90s, I knew people who, I knew a person who would read a book while driving. He would hold a novel open on his steering wheel and steer with his knees while driving. I knew somebody who would uh, smoke cannabis from a bong while driving, again steering with his knees. Um, I suspect that these people nowadays, or, or similar people, would be texting while driving. Um, so I don't think, I, I think probably both, I think Reese Jones is probably right, that actually overall this isn't actually causing any more deaths, it's probably not actually causing that much less, inatten less, atten uh, less attentiveness to the road, it's probably just a shift in what people are distracted by. Whew. Feels good to get that off my chest. That's it for this week. Until next week, when I tell you again what's happening in the West. See you later.